Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Fox Nomad Podcast. I'm your host, Fox Nomad Anil Polat. I've got a fantastic episode for you today. My guest is Akshay Nanavati. He is an author, a motivational speaker, and an adventurer. And we talk all about fear. We talk about why fear is beneficial, why we should challenge our fears, and how we can overcome our fears. We talk all about this on this episode, as well as what it's like to ski, you know, ski in Antarctica. We get into all of that, and I think you're going to find this episode very useful and very inspirational. Hello, Akshay. Thanks uh, for joining the podcast. Um, You have one of the most interesting bios ever. I mean, it's it's really hard to to sort of you know narrow it down. It's kind of all things. I I want to see if you can maybe describe what you do in in a sort of a nutshell, and then we can go from there. I would say what I do now would be, I mean, the most conventional definition would be I'm an adventurer. You know, I'm an adventurer by trade, uh, more specifically a polar adventurer. So I explore the polar regions. I was just in the Arctic earlier this year. I was in Antarctica a year and a half ago, uh, lost two fingers to frostbite out there, and now training for a much bigger expedition in Antarctica. But this is, of course, a culmination and, and a result of a lifetime of playing on the edges in multiple different terrains from the mountains to caves to to being in war as a u.s marine so essentially i'm someone who likes to explore the edges of mind body spirit and to see where that will take me and how did that begin i mean what's what's your sort of origin story Uh, because it seems like you're doing superhero stuff (laughs) <laughs> definitely not nothing superhero i'm very blessed to have uh, uh, lived a good life and played on some of these edges but it began yeah, i was born in india lived in india li- had a pretty good life you know my parents weren't extremely wealthy but we certainly weren't poor kind of a good middle class uh, upbringing and moved to the u.s at 13 and after moving here i got very heavily into drugs and alcohol like lost two friends to addiction, used to cut myself, burn myself, I have these scars on my arm today. So very self-destructive. And I saw the movie Black Hawk Down. Have you ever seen that movie? Yeah. That Good movie, movie, yeah, that movie planted the seed that changed my life. Almost overnight, I stopped doing drugs and decided to join the Marines. And that was what planted the seed that really became who I am today. Because in the Marines, I first learned the beauty of suffering, the beauty of adversity, you know, the gift of going to war with myself, confronting my fears, doing something extremely hard, not only for my own spiritual growth, but for something and someone else as well. In the Marines, nobody cares about your well-being. What matters is the men and the mission. So you're living for an institution, for a group that is more important than you, you know, and separate from all the politics or any of that. It's just on the ground out there. We were serving for the tribe, you know, and for the people. So that experience is what really birthed in me the essence of everything I am today. Because after joining the Marines, I then began systematically confronting all my fears. I used to be scared of heights. So I went rock climbing, skydiving, mountain climbing. I used to be scared of tight spaces. So I went caving, cave diving, you know, scared of open water. So I went scuba diving, ice diving, you name it. But it's the Marines that really first taught me the beauty of of adversity and doing things that would test you to your limits and beyond. And when you go into the Marines, it it, it seems like you have a a sort of a propensity for adventure, right? So, you know, things that are, are giving these sort of high sensory experience. But when you go into the Marines, you know, is there a kind of a clash between what you're expecting and then the, the sort of the reality on the ground of of what the day-to-day is like and also what the fear, what, like what kind of fearful, you know, scary things that you're actually encountering? Yeah, one one thing that Marines teaches you, which is a, I think an accidental spiritual learning that I didn't necessarily was fully wasn't fully aware of at the time, is to release expectations and just surrender and accept what is because so much of it is outside of control. Meaning to say, you know, there's a lot of things I love about the Marines, about the experience, the brotherhood, the tremendous wealth of like life experience and the human condition exploring it. But there's also a lot of bullshit you have to put up with being in the Marines. You know, you have no freedom to make your own decisions. If somebody tells you to do something, you got to go do it. And so the, the quicker you are to just accept what is instead of resisting what is, 
the more you will find peace in that experience, you know, from not only going into boot camp, but from military, from the training to as well as going to war. I was deployed in Iraq in 2007, you know, and there was a lot of times where you're told to do shit. You don't want to do it. Like we're exhausted. We go on missions. You still have to go whether you like it or not, you know? And so that, that aspect of just releasing expectations and it didn't come instantly there were moments where i was extremely miserable out there i still remember in my journals in iraq you know i would be so pissed off the first six weeks of my deployment and ultimately i realized look i have seven months here i can bitch i can whine i can complain or i can choose to accept what is and find the beauty in the experience you know because granted i chose to be in the marines i volunteered to go uh but once i was out there i no longer had freedom so instead of trying to resist that I just learned to accept it and be with it and embrace it. I can, every opportunity, every moment in life has an opportunity to find something beautiful if you look for it. And so acceptance, which is really a foundational for spiritual growth as well. It, Iraq taught me that a lot in, in the core. And, you know, when you climb a mountain, when you, when you go to Antarctica, there's obviously your life is at risk, um, but it's sort of a risk that you're choosing to take you know, at a given moment, whereas in the military, you know, you were probably confronted with situations where you're risking your life, but it's not a choice, right? How how do you kind of overcome that kind of fear? You know, you're, you're giving in, but there must be, I would imagine, at least for me, like a strong urge to resist or to run or to, you know, that's a different kind of uh, confronting fear when you have to, in other words, it's not coming from, you know, within kind of. Yeah, as in like I didn't volunteer. I mean, granted, again, I did volunteer to join the Marines. I volunteered to go to war, but I get what you mean. It's a different kind as in like I'm just choosing to go out onto the edge because you're put in circumstances. Ultimately, you know, the the brain's response of fear is really no different. Uh, how we react, like the the content of the conditions we create, but the brain react. the fear is fear to the brain, right? We have our beliefs, our paradigms, our constructs, that create our sense of reality that change how we how we relate to said experience but when you when you are able to recognize those constructs of our own reality then fear is fear right and so when i was in iraq like i'd be one of my jobs out there was to walk in front of our vehicle convoys looking for bombs before they could be used to kill me and my fellow Marines. So as you can imagine, this was a very dangerous job because if somebody was to get killed first, it would be me, you know, me and the one other buddy who would, who would do that. But how you move through fear, whether it's in that context or me choosing to go to Antarctica, many tools, but one of which is what's the why on the other side of that fear? You know, if your why on the other side of that fear is more powerful, more important than the fear, you will find a way to move through it. You know, like the analogy it sometimes gives it, if your house is burning down and your child or your, or your, you know, your loved one is inside the house. Most people would say, yeah, I'd find a way to get in there to save them, right? Like I would do that because there's a why that's strong enough. So a lot of times we don't know what that why is, so we don't move through the fear. And, and the other big thing is trying to resist the experience of fear. And this is the very essence of fear Vana and the whole ethos of my brand is to combat the demonization of fear. You know, fear is not a bad emotion. We, we have these experiences in the human condition that says fear, stress, anxiety, guilt, sadness, anger. These are quote unquote negative emotions. They're not negative. They just are. Fear is a very valuable emotion in the human condition. People hear what I do and they see what I do and they think I'm fearless. I am far from it. I am terrified everything I do. And I'm not just saying that. It genuinely scares me. I was more scared going on a date with my fiance than I am most of the things I do. So I'm constantly scared and now fiance, but when we first went on a date a couple of months ago. So, you know, I'm, I'm constantly scared in the human condition, but now I don't judge that fear. That's the real problem. It's not the emotion. It's the judgment of that we have around the emotion. So when you coming back to what I was saying earlier about awareness of what is and then acceptance of what is. So when you release that judgment, you can recognize there's no bad or good emotions. There's no bad or good experiences. There's only emotions and there's only experiences. And we get to decide what we do with them. It's the assignment of that label, that judgment around our emotions that changes how we relate to it. So as an example, you know, I was working with a client who went to Iceland on his, he was going to Iceland on his own for a vacation. First time going on his own for a vacation. So he was terrified, you know, and he was so scared. And he said, he looked at all the things I, I would do. And he would say like, what's wrong with me? Why am I scared? You know, you do all these crazy things. But the thing is, the only reason he was scared is he had never done it before. The reason I'm not scared going on a relaxing vacation on my own is not because I'm braver. It's because my brain has more references because I've done it before to say this is not an experience of risk. 
It took, it takes no courage for me to go on a vacation on my own because there's no fear for him. It took courage, but the problem was not the fear. That was an experience. That was a, a subconscious response to stimuli that the brain says this is risky because he had never done it before. The problem was his judgment. What's wrong with me? Why am I afraid? I should not be afraid, right? It's the resistance because the world tells us I mean, how many times do you even hear this in the most the, the biggest names in personal development? You know, be fearless. Don't be scared of failure. I'm terrified of failure. That's not a bad thing, you know? So when and when like one of my many mantras is fear propels you to prepare. So when you engage it, fear propels you to prepare. So what I mean by that is like even writing a book on fear, I was terrified. I was scared people would judge it, would think it's stupid, would would think I'm stupid. So because of that, I said, okay, what am I scared of? And I literally write this down. Why am I scared? What's the worst case scenario? Okay, got it. If this is the worst case scenario, how do I prepare for that? So because I was scared of writing a bad book, I studied from authors like Jack Canfield, the Chicken Soup for the Soul author, you know, Tim Ferriss, people who've written very successful books. And I said, got it. Now, how do I learn to be a better writer? So because I was scared of writing a bad book, I wrote a better book, one that was ultimately worthy of being endorsed by the Dalai Lama. But the fear is what drove me. The fear had fuel that made me better at my craft whether it be writing or as an adventurer. I'm terrified of dying today. I'm terrified of going out to these places that I go and something bad happening. And because of that, I train as hard as I do because I'm scared of the worst case scenario. So fear has value, however it shows up. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point it, that, you know, I, yeah, I, I just, as you were speaking, I was thinking of, you know, you see documentaries where people are, you know, free diving with sharks, for example, like big yeah. sharks that could just yeah. tear the person apart, but they're cautious, right? They, they, they even, they are responding to an unfamiliar situation with caution. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a very useful thing, but you know, we, exactly. And then, you know, we have the capacity to kind of rationalize and think over it potentially. Now, what are, you know, I guess the, the people who, there are a lot of people who don't want to get into situations that are going to make them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say to somebody who says, well, I can just stay at home, you know, do my regular routine and Hey, I'll be fine. You know, I, I, I know what the risks are there and I can be just as happy. Why risk yeah. my life in Antarctica? Yeah. G great question. First off, I certainly am not saying like Antarctica is the only path to enlightenment, right? I'm playing on a very extreme edge. I'm well aware of that. <laughs> uh, you don't have to go do the things that I do to find the kind of growth that I'm discussing. The point is you can stay nestled in your bubble your whole life. Sure. But there's a reason why, as Henry David Thoreau said, most men, and I would argue most people live lives of quiet desperation. If you don't seek out a worthy struggle, struggle will find you anyway. If you don't seek out a meaningful challenge, and the world around us could not be more clear evidence of this, right? We're more comfortable than ever before, and yet people are more miserable than ever before. So you can say, all right, I'm not going to go out there, wherever the there is. It doesn't have to be Antarctica, right? I'm not going to go outside my comfort zone. I'm not going to go leap into the unknown because I'm safer here. And it's natural to do that because the brain's first you know, the, the, the brain's primary concern is keeping us alive. And so that's why people will stay in a, in a discomfort rather than go leap into the unknown because the unknown is more scarier. As the saying goes, the devil you know is greater than the devil you don't, you know? So I'll stay in an unknown discomfort rather than going out there because if I go out there, I could die. You know, the, I mean, even if the out there is not like Antarctica, but that's what the brain is, is perceiving, right? It's number one goal is to keep us alive. So you can choose not to do that. But you'll find yourself more miserable than ever before. And look, I've experienced a life of extreme opulence. Honestly, like my family now is well off. I could live a great, comfortable life the rest of my life not doing these things. So point is to say what I'm speaking from is not like it's not a necessity that drives me to it. It's a desire because I know the other hand. And I see, I, man, my, I, have, I have extended family. I, I know people who are some of the wealthiest people in the world. And they don't choose to leave their comfort zones in any law, in any context. And I will tell you firsthand, and this is, you can call it anecdotal, but there's also research to justify this, that people, they are miserable. They are absolutely miserable. You know, even Professor Mihai Csikmensiha, who wrote the book Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, one of the largest researchers on happiness, said, um, the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times. Although such moments can be great if we have worked hard to attain them, the best moments are the ones we have voluntarily pushed ourselves in, in, a, in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So if you want new experiences in life, we're human beings, we crave variety, we crave excitement. If you want something you've never had before, you have to do something you've never done before.
And that means going out there. That means pushing yourself. And again, it doesn't have to be Antarctica. Do something minimal, you know, go to a cold tub, go run a little bit. And if you've never run before, do a hard workout, take a cold shower, go talk to a woman or a man in a, in a, in a bar, right? Like wherever the thing is, do something that challenges you. And when you start doing it again, I used to be, as I said, before the Marines, I had a good life and I used to be scared of everything, like scared of heights, scared of, uh, I still remember when I was a kid, we, we, you know, my mom, I don't remember the story, but my mom told me this where, um, she put me in a Ferris wheel, not even a roller coaster, a Ferris wheel. And I was so scared. I freaked out, you know? So I know that like how scared it is, how, 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 what it's like to be so scared of pushing yourself, but that's why I did it. And when I saw the rewards of it, when I tasted the, 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 this awe inspiring gift of the human soul that, that you can only unearth by playing on those edges, I got hooked and that's why I keep going. So the, the, the promise is a life of bliss, a life of awe that you cannot fathom by staying in the place you've always known. But you got to go out there into the unknown to find it. So you would say the challenge for everybody is a different level of challenge. It doesn't, it can just be getting over, I don't know, let's say you're scared of riding a bike or maybe you want to join a book club and you're shy of, you know, speaking with other people yeah. in a large context, something like that, you know, right? Exactly. Find your edge and play on that edge, push that edge a little bit. You know, I didn't, I didn't get to skiing across Antarctica overnight that it came from like doing smaller things and pushing that edge and see where it takes you. And the more, when you do it, you will hundred percent start finding the rewards in it. That's why, I mean, like, again, this is coming from experience. And if you look at research validates this, right. It's pushing that, pushing our edges playing in the unknown where we find the bliss that is the human experience and, and we, we brought up antarctica a few times so i, I think you know we've, we've got to talk <laughs> about it um but, but i do want to talk about running as well uh, sure uh, um, but what i guess what draws you to antarctica but also to cold places it seems like you know um the, the, i guess there's something inherently dangerous about a place like that you know with with snow, skiing, all, all those things. Um, is it that, or is there something about that environment in particular that draws you uh, to a place like Antarctica? You know, for I'll start with the cold and then Antarctica. What I love about the cold is it's so unforgiving. It demands perfection out of you. If you mess up, there's consequences. And when you're placed in such an environment that demands you to be perfect or the best version of yourself, you rise to the challenge, right? You become the best version of yourself. And how beautiful is that? So that's one thing I love about the cold. Antarctica in particular, because it is such a barren land, right? There's 95% of Antarctica has no life. There's only penguins in one corner of Antarctica. So imagine like, it, like this land was created that has that is so inhospitable to life. And here we go voluntarily, you know, a few handful of human beings go play on play in that land. So to me, that absolute isolation, that solitude, that silence, only in silence can you really start to hear. You hear things you don't hear in the distraction of the normal life. And that is a profoundly beautiful experience. It's like you are unearthing wisdom and treasures in the human spirit and the human soul that can only be unearthed in such depths of solitude, isolation, suffering, and silence. You know, you have to battle the dragon to find the treasure. And Antarctica becomes this playground to battle the biggest dragons that can possibly find because it is so barren. It's literally inhospitable to forget about human life, but all life on Earth, you know? And that's such a profoundly, I mean, I remember when I flew there last time and I landed, the first words out of my mouth, not even consciously, were, I'm in Antarctica, I'm home. And I whispered, I'm home, you know? And I felt like this is a, a land that allows me to it becomes, you know, such an extreme edge in nature. It's a mirror to the human soul because when nature acts out of malice or hostility, or sorry, not not malice, acting acts out of hostility, like a violent polar storm, right? Minus forty degrees, hurricane force winds. It's not acting out of intent or malice. It's not like, you know, I've seen human beings do evil things to each other, and there's intent there. Nature has no intent; it just is. And because of that pure isness, it is a mirror to the human soul. It is a mirror to our own self. And then it forces you to go within to see what you will find. And that self-discovery, I mean, the greatest hero's journey any one of us can ever take is the journey within, you know? The the, the journey without is just a, simply a, a, an opportunity to ultimately go within. And that's what the draw is. Yeah, I was watching one of your videos from, from Antarctica and I saw, you know, you opened this tent and there's this wind and I don't even yeah. know how to describe. <laughs> it's not like wind that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And 
the, the, what I was thinking was the envi- that environment does does not care about you. Like you, you know, you, I would imagine you don't feel special. You don't feel exactly. It, it, it's you're very just, humbling. Yeah, it, it looked like it was just. I mean, you might as well have been on Mars. It, it, it looked yeah incredible. Um, how do you you know you said you talked a lot about the preparation for a trip like that for an adventure like that. But there got to be you know how much can you rely on past knowledge and how much are you having to plan as you are actually there because it's you know it's not like a lot of people are going yeah um so you know to one degree in terms of past knowledge seeking counsel from other mentors i have many polar mentors and friends and then playing on the edges myself as i said i didn't get to something like that overnight so i would push myself a little bit onto certain edges you know first time i ever got into a cold weather camping i went to an intro to mountaineering course this was a lifetime ago now, but I still remember the first time as an example, I went, I went winter camping and I'm not someone who was born in winter, right? Like I grew up in Bombay, India. There was no, I didn't see snow till I was 14, right? So this was not something like I, I was accustomed to. And I went winter camping and uh, it, it, when you sleep in winter you, in your sleeping bag, you, you take a pee bottle and you pee in the pee bottle. I didn't have a pee bottle and I was like, oh, it's kind of gross peeing in a bottle. First time I had to get out of my tent in the middle of the night when it's cold as hell outside. I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to get a damn pee bottle. And you stop caring about stupid things like that, you know? So I pushed myself a little bit and I would even do things like, I remember a couple of winters ago, I was up in Vermont and when a winter storm would hit, I would go outside and sometimes even in the cold water and I would literally say outside, I would repeat this mantra to myself, be the eye of the storm be the eye of the storm. So I would train myself in very extreme scenarios and practice saying, staying still, staying centered in the face of a very literal storm, you know? So you, so you train by pushing the edge one inch at a time so that when I am encountered, I am confronted with a real brutal storm in a place like Antarctica, I'm centered, you know? Cause the, ultimately the external storms do not have to break our internal peace. If you don't train, they will break it. That's why a lot of a lot of times people, and I've been there myself, where something would happen and we react and we, you know, we freak out, we lose ourselves. But the more you train yourself to stay still, to be the eye of the storm, it doesn't matter what what whatever storm life throws your way, you can be centered in the face of it. I would also do things like I spend 10 days sitting in a dark room like pitch darkness, cannot see your hand in front of you, darkness, completely, uh, completely dark and, and alone for 10 full days, 24 hours a day to practice being with myself, to practice solitude, to practice isolation. And that built a better relationship with my own mind and my spirit. So I could endure whatever I would be forced to endure on these challenges. Wow. That that seems like of all the things you've done, that seems probably one of the more, for me, it sounds like one of the more difficult things to do. You know, the silence is one thing, but also the no yeah, you know, just complete darkness. Complete darkness. Like you could not see your hand in front of you. Yeah. And, and Sitting what, still with your mind is intense. <laughs> what happens to your senses? I mean, you know, at the end of the 10 days, what happens when the world, when the lights go back on? You know, how, how does your body react? When I first came out of the dark, as I've done the darkest retreat twice, I did it first times for seven days, second time for 10 days. And I came out and I saw the light. I mean, the way the world looked in those few moments, I've never seen the light shine in that way. And I remember like in a very, I remember thinking to myself, this deep sense of gratitude for all the suffering I've ever experienced in life, because I realized in a very visceral and concrete way that you cannot really see the power and the gift of the light unless you've first been in the dark. So it it, it reveals to you the duality of the human experience and why when you play on one edge, it only amplifies the other, you know, when you experience the depths of pain, that's the only way you'll experience the heights of pleasure. You know, you have to have a valley to have a summit. They can't exist one without the other. So to your point about your earlier question, you know, about why go out there and play on the edge. If you don't, if you don't seek out, like you have to leap and be willing to fall and you're going to fall. I've fallen a ton, literally and, and figuratively, right? I've lost, like I said, lost fingers. I've gotten beat up. I've gotten hypothermia, heat exhaustion, like all, you name it, you know, physical injuries, psychological injuries from playing on some edges. You know, after the war, I struggled with PTSD, depression, drinking heavily, all kinds of things. But by being, experiencing the darkness, experiencing the depth of my demons confronting the the pain of life it's amplified the heights of pleasure it's amplified the heights of awe i'm able to experience i mean to this day you know when i take a hot shower 
I cannot express to you the gratitude I feel because I know what it's like. I know it's soon going to be gone and I know what it's like when you don't have it, you know? So it it, it makes life an adventure. It, it increases the the gratitude, the bliss, the, the, the day-to-day content of this human experience when you play on that. Otherwise, life is just one static line. And when life is a static line, you cannot know a summit. You cannot know highs, you know? It'll just be the mundane. It'll be that quiet desperation. That's why you go play. Yes, you're going to be in pain. But when you truly, like when you, the more you play on the edges of pain, the more you can find the beauty in pain. You know, we have this misconception that like happiness is the elimination of sadness, but happiness is not the elimination of sadness. Happiness is the ability to find the gift in sadness. Sadness is a valuable emotion. Like I, there are times to this day where I will sometimes consciously watch a scene from a war movie, knowing it'll make me cry. It'll trigger my survivor's guilt from the war. I lost a junior, I lost junior Marines to suicide. I lost a buddy in the war. And I do that because there's value in that sadness. There's value in those tears. There's value in experiencing the pain of the human condition because that's what only allows me to feel joy. And I also know what it's like to be without that. When I came back from the war, I was very numb. I was extremely numb to the human condition, numb to emotions. And that's not a a good way to live, you know? Yeah, I mean, you bring up a really good point is you you can't know what happiness is until you've experienced the opposite of it, right? Like you... There is no perfection. I think I I would guess that you are somewhat of a perfectionist is kind <laughs> of uh, you know mm-hmm. what I'm what I'm getting. But absolutely. I, I think you know part of the 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 sort of the letting go of the strangle that perfectionism can be is understanding that there you can't nothing is perfect, right? There's no pure happiness. There's no you, you need you know, you need the opposite to be able to kind of see what yeah. the spectrum is. Um, so when you get, you know, physically injured, um, you know, like it, where, where you're getting frostbite and you can see, you know, the effects on your body and it's, and you, you know, you're in a situation where, you know, you don't know how bad it's going to get, how far it's going to go. How does that affect your ability to confront the fear? So now it's affecting you on a physical level that, that, is maybe progressing. You don't know how you could lose a hand, you know, you, you don't yeah. know you could die. How, how, how do you, you know, deal with that in, in that kind of situation? The, the core mindset, there's a Latin phrase that says amor fati. Amor fati means love fate. So literally when uh, it's easy to love fate when life is good, but can you love fate when life isn't? So when I got frostbite in Antarctica about two years ago now, I wasn't, I wasn't walking around with no gloves. I wasn't doing anything stupid. It wasn't my first cold weather expedition. I'd been on many cold weather expeditions before. And yet it happened. It happened on the 17th day of my trip, you know? So there, while there wasn't things that I was doing wrong, there are things I could be doing even better. So at, genuinely, when the frostbite hit, the only disappointment I felt was that I didn't complete the mission. But immediately, I, I felt gratitude because I was like, this is awesome. This is such a cool opportunity because now I have to be even better when I go out back into the cold. So it was genuinely a gratitude that like, I will have to perform even better. What more, uh, how could that not be a gift? Not to mention, like I viewed it as a really cool story in everybody here is writing a story of your life. You know, when I look back on my life one day, whenever, whenever I come confronting death, I will look back on an epic life that I've lived. And so when you look at the epicness of the life you've lived, everything becomes a, like a cool story. But even when I was getting my fingers cut off, you know, my sur- finger had to be surgically removed. And my dad was like, you seem to be enjoying this. Like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, it's not that I wanted it to happen, but now that it's happened, it's a pretty cool story. <laughs> it's a pretty cool life experience, you know? So when you view it that way, like everything is just part of this badass adventure that is the human life. You know, the story of my life is pretty cool. I didn't want to lose fingers, but I did. It happened. Now it's awesome. And there's a gift in it. The gift is this very cool, like even now as a speaker, it's pretty cool when I get to show two missing fingers of my story, you know, like it's pretty awesome. Uh, Again, like it's not that I wanted it to happen, but it happened. So now I'll find the gift in it. The key thing is training yourself regardless of what happens. There is an opportunity regardless. Like as an example, you know, when COVID first hit, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, I can't go to gyms. I can't go train outside because the parks are closed. So, you know, I'm losing, I'm putting on weight because of that. And I was like, that's, that's whether or not you agree with the COVID policies is not the point. The point is there was an opportunity if you look for it. So to inspire people, I ran 50 miles, 80 kilometers around a cul-de-sac outside my house. So it was like a 0.05 miles. So a thousand loops around this parking lot, essentially, 
you don't need a lot of room to go suffer. There's a that was a beautiful experience to run around a freaking parking lot all night, you know. So there's always an opportunity, but you have to ask yourself, what is the opportunity in this? Everything is an opportunity. So physical, like losing fingers, the heat exhaustion that I got, uh, my hypothermia, it was a gift. It taught me something, you know. Uh, T. S. Eliot says. Only those who risk going too far can find out how far they can possibly go. So when you play on the edges, you're going to get hurt a little bit. But would I trade it for not for anything in the world? I mean, even people ask me, you know, when you got frostbite, were you, did you ever consider not going back to Antarctica? I mean, the moment I was being evacuated from the field, I was planning my return to Antarctica. Why would I not go back? If you play on the edges, you're going to get hurt. But the life experience, the rewards, you know, I wouldn't be here having this conversation with you if I wasn't. <laughs> the person that I am playing on these edges, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a gift and the get the getting hurt from time to time. It's just part of the awesome adventure <laughs> that makes life worth living. Contrast gives life its flavor. Yeah. It's you, 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 you phrase it and you put it in a really interesting way, which is like, imagine that you're reading somebody's like a fiction novel and you're just yeah. reading the adventure of this, this character. And, but you're the, you're the character. You're the character. And, and I, I like the point you brought up earlier as well is like the challenge doesn't have to be Antarctica, right? It can be running a mile or exactly. it, it doesn't even have to be physical, right? It can be going to talk to somebody or, or maybe joining a group, you know, yeah, all kinds of things. Uh, so everybody's story, I, 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 I think when a lot of people hear like these kind of great challenges, they think, oh man, I have to go to Antarctica, like. I'm not facing my fears, you know, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying like, it doesn't really matter what the, the challenge is, as long as it's a challenge for you. Right. Exactly. As long as it's a challenge for you, like me going to, let's say, uh, Antarctica is scary with a, a, a smaller climb, for example. And if it ha if I don't have any fear, it takes no courage on my part. So for somebody, you know, Speaking and speaking on a small stage at a Toastmasters event, for example, could be more terrifying than me doing like an Antarctica crossing, right? So that person is taking it's more courage on their part to do their thing, to do that than it does takes on my part, right? So the point is, whatever the thing is, it should scare you a little bit. And the key thing is, the key thing is, you can listen to a podcast, you can read a book, you can do all these things. But the only life experience, the only place you're going to get the true learnings is playing in the arena. Like nothing I say is going to make the, the discomfort of that go away. And that's not the intention. Because I think often when I've done the talks about this, people are waiting to feel the discomfort, like waiting for that discomfort to go away to do it. You know, I just need to be confident. You'll hear this too, right? Just be confident as you do it. But you can't be confident if you've never done something before. Confidence is the result of action, not the fuel for action. So don't wait to be confident. It's going to be uncomfortable, you know? So anybody listening to this, like do the hard thing, whatever that hard thing is, go play in the arena, but don't wait for the discomfort or the fear or the pain or the challenge of it to go away. That's the whole thing. You know, you got to leap, you got to move through that. You got to leap into the unknown and be willing to fall. And that's where the rewards lie. That's where you're going to find the bliss of the human soul. It's not, yeah. Like it's not that something is just going to magic, confidence is just going to magically appear. Exactly. Get this one thing and then, you know, do this thing or exactly. It's I still like... freaking dread going out on tire dragon sessions. I live in Arizona. Now it's a little cooler, but when the summer it was like 120 degrees, every time I would go out to train in that, I would be like, this sucks, <laughs> you know? But so every time it was like that required courage to step out the door, you know? So uh, that's the thing. Don't wait for that to go away. I, I got to ask you about the environment. I'm I'm currently in Germany right now where it's like in the 80, 80 degrees, which is not, not normal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All. Yeah. And going to the, these, these polar regions, have you, have you seen any, you know, are there differences? Is it, un, is the weather there unusual as well? Uh, you know, we hear a lot about Antarctica and the, the, the polar regions on the news that they're, they're changing. Is that something that you've seen as well? In the Arctic, for sure. Like uh, in the Arctic, like when I first got into polar expert, polar travel, polar expeditions, people could ski to the North Pole from Canada, from land. Now the Arctic Ocean is melting so much that people can't even, you can't do a full North Pole expedition without 
confronting significant chunks of water. So it's very noticeable and evident in the Arctic. I was just in the Arctic earlier this year as well. In Antarctica, uh, to a certain degree, I mean, I'm, I've only been there once, but I've read and seen. Uh, but like Antarctica is always going to be hostile to certain, <laughs> you know, and, un and unforgiving uh, to a certain degree. But I've read about how it's warming. But in the Arctic, it's much more like noticeable, very, very tangible uh, to see the the effects of climate change in the Arctic. Interesting. Yeah. It was yeah. Just you know, from there are not so many people who've been there. So it's in, it, exactly. interesting yeah. to hear when you, you're witnessing that. Um, yeah. I, I did want to, before I let you go, talk a little bit about running just out of selfishness because I I love to run. I've run a lot. Um, awesome. And it's one of those things that once you get into running, you just, you're like, you just start, so I'm going for a run today. And then the runs yeah. get longer and longer. And it's like this little challenge that you have every day. What is it like running an ultra marathon? And what does that even mean for the people listening? You know, we're, we're, the Berlin Marathon just happened. And we yeah. hear about these, you know, 26 miles. What's an ultra marathon? So an ultra marathon is anything more than a marathon. So at the lowest level is a 50K, which is 31 miles. But then it goes up anywhere from 50K to 50 miles to 100K, which is 80 miles, 100 miles, 24-hour runs, 48-hour runs, 200 miles. It can you know go up kind of to all kinds of crazy levels. The biggest one I've done is a 24-hour run. Uh, and then I've done a bunch of other ones, like 80 miles, 72 miles, 48 miles, like a bunch of other 50 miles, uh, 100K. I've done a bunch of other ones, but the biggest one was a 24 hour. Wow. And how do you, is there a preparation for that? Do you know, what does the preparation look like? And I'm curious, what are the kind of things that you're doing along the way? Like how much do you eat? You know, what kind of calories are you yeah. taking in and all that? You, you know, you want to be uh, preparation wise, you want to be building up your mileage. Uh, obviously, don't like if you've never run before running for 50 miles, it's probably gonna be a little bit of a stretch, right? So you build up your mileage. But a lot of it is going to be a mental battle. That's the key thing. People often hear that and think there's no way I could do it. But I'm not the fastest runner in the world. I'll be the first to tell you I'm by no means a fast runner. But it's but I enjoy the mental challenge of just going for a long time. And that's another key thing is like, even when I first got an ultra running, I always thought the, the ultra runners I follow the best ultra runners it's like somehow they're they don't feel the pain that's how they keep moving through but that's not true everybody including me and ultra runners will tell you they feel the suffering just as much as the rest of us they just have gotten better at transcending it as have i now over the years you know i i just thought somehow they don't feel the pain that's how they can do it that's which is not true so the key thing coming back to what everything i was saying is like don't expect it to be fun i mean it is fun in a way but don't expect it to be like all sunshine rainbows and unicorns right you're going to go through some deep miserable moments but that's the point that the, i mean like you're not going to run an ultra if you're expecting something easy so uh that mental battle is the key t thing and that again like everything else you're going to learn to challenge yourself one step at a time, push yourself a little bit, push yourself a little bit, and you'll keep building that mental resilience to endure it. As far as like nutrition and all that, I mean, there's many, like I haven't, I've only done one formal ultra marathon race. All the other ones I've done are just on my own. Cause for me, it's, I like the solitude of it. So, uh, you know, I don't do big races or anything like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just my personal preference. Um, and usually you're eating anywhere from like 200 to 250 calories an hour is kind of a good, good, uh, good formula to follow. And then sometimes I've done like deprivation runs where you'll constantly uh, uh, consciously deprive, deprive yourself of some nutrition and water to kind of go deeper into it. Like this wasn't a run, but uh, earlier this summer I did uh, after five and a half days of no food, I went on a five hour hike with 3,500 feet of elevation gain in 102 degrees. And I hadn't eaten a single calorie in five and a half days. So things got really bad. Like I was nauseous. I was cramping. I was dizzy. I threw up a bunch, you know? So sometimes I'll do things like that <laughs> just to exercise the will and the mind in those challenges. But uh, otherwise it's just um, a mental battle primarily. And then there's also like different things you can do for nutrition and water to keep the food, to keep your body fighting as well. And, and do you have to worry about animals? I mean, like if you're running... 24 hours, I'm assuming it's outdoor in the woods or in nature. 
you have to worry about like a, a bear? You know, that... it, yeah. It, I mean, I guess again, yeah. Depending on where, where you're going, right? Like when I did the 24 hour run, it was in New Jersey. So no, uh, there was no concern uh, where I was at, but I mean, like I've run in Montana and uh, uh, Glacier National Park in Montana, not an ultra, but just doing some training runs out there. And, uh, you know, I had to carry bear mace with me just in case. <laughs> so depending on the terrain you, you are running and the place, you want to be smart about it uh, and navigate that, you know, like I wouldn't go out in the middle of the night in an Arizona desert running on mm -hmm. my own because there's a ton of rattlers and all kinds of stuff out there, you know, so you just be careful where you're where you, where you're training wow well it, it's been a, a really fascinating conversation um i i you know i think all, people can draw a lot of inspiration from all the things that you've done because it's it's such an amazing list but also like you say like you know you get scared there's not something that you've been blessed with you know externally like you, somebody didn't just give you a box of of confidence or you know exactly. fearless pills and things like that yeah um what where can people find you um what are you up to now you know what, what projects are you working on now yeah and uh let everybody know sure the big thing that i'm training for now is a solo 110 day 1700 mile ski crossing of the entire continent of antarctica this has never been done before without dogs or wind power or kites so the goal is to do the first ever coast to coast crossing purely on skis, no no dogs or wind. So I'm training for that to do that uh, two year just over a year from now. That's the goal. And in the meantime, I'm just training, going up to Minnesota for another expedition this winter. That's my main focus is getting the mind body spirit ready for that. And you can find me on uh, Instagram is Fearvana. The book Fearvana F E A R V A N A is on Amazon Kindle. Uh, audio, audible, all of that good stuff, and fearvana.com as well. And then there's also a place on the um, on the on online where we're doing a crowdfunding campaign for the Antarctic crossing. So if anybody's gotten any value from anything I shared, I would sure appreciate any support because to fund the Antarctic crossing is 750k. So the great soul crossing.com, great G R E A T soul S O U L crossing.com. I have a crowdfunding campaign going to help raise funds for the Antarctic crossing. We've raised 173,000 right now and uh, keeping at it. So any support there would sure be uh, much appreciated. Sweet. Yeah. And I'll, I'll link to it down in the show notes so people can find it and, and donate. Cool. And, Thank you, uh, brother. Keep, keep track of your adventure, man. That, that sounds like, it sounds like a lot of fun. I, for me, <laughs> when I hear that, I'm like, man, that sounds like a lot of fun. Also scary. You know, it is fun know. and scary. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they they kind of go hand in hand, right? A lot of exactly. things are, fun are, are a little bit scary too. Well, exactly. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Best well, thank of you luck with me. all the training and everything. And uh, maybe we'll catch up after, after you cross uh, Antarctica. Sounds good, brother. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Fox and Mud podcast. Thank you, Akshay, for being a guest on the show. And thank all of you for listening. If you haven't already, make sure you give this a like, a subscribe, five stars, wherever you happen to be listening or watching. It really helps us get the word out about the show. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.